another law that got implemented was this whole thing about purchase permits. I mean, they've always have been there, at least since I can recall. And if I recall correctly, uh, these pistol purchase permits came in vogue in uh, 1927, the Michigan Firearms Act of 1927. It's like, gee, Rick, well, how can you remember that? Well, being involved with the gun rights community, you know, I've done some, some research on these gun laws and actually understanding where they came from. You know, there was a very interesting case that uh, happened, get this, in the city of Detroit in 1925. This was uh, the Ossian Suite case. Not sure if you all are familiar with this, but uh, it's a gentleman, African-American man who uh, went uh, down south. I believe he went to Morehouse College uh, in the south. He completed his education. He was trained, Howard. Yeah, he was trained in medicine, he became a doctor, and he wanted to come back to Detroit, and he wanted to provide some service to his community. And uh, it was underserved, and a lot of people needed his services. And eventually, he built a rather thriving practice. And as a person who goes off to school, and they start a profession, they make some money, they acquire uh, status in the community, there's nothing wrong with someone wanting to enjoy the, uh, the fruits of their labor. And so what he wanted to do, he wanted to move. He wanted to buy a, a property in a nicer neighborhood. The neighborhood that he chose uh, had what was called deed restrictions. That is, in the law during that era, if you were... Uh, well, be quite blunt, if you were black, they wouldn't sell you the house. Things that pretty much are illegal, to now, illegal today, but uh, anyway, he found a motivated seller who didn't care who he sold the house to. All he knew was that the money was green, and he took it, and he sold the house. And once uh, the Sweet family moved into their home, they had uh, a feeling that people in that community weren't going to be happy about it. Undeterred, he and uh, individuals from uh, amongst his friends, I believe there were four or five other family members that joined him, uh, they proceeded to move into the residence. And on that evening, there were a lot of people in the neighborhood who weren't too happy about it. And then it became a nightly occurrence where there were huge mobs outside of his home. And it wasn't until, I don't know, maybe not even a week in, that someone had the unmitigated gall and the audacity to fire a gun into their window. And of course, Dr. Sweet and his fellow friends who were there, they were armed, they did what anybody else would do. They defended themselves, and they actually shot back. And in shooting back, there were two individuals who were hit. At least one of those persons died. Believe it or not, there was a cadre of police who were also stationed at the scene. And they actually witnessed the assault upon the, the residents and they witnessed the response. Immediately, the police were stormed the home and they arrested everyone that was in the home. And as they did that, uh, we didn't have such provisions in the law that we have today, right? Today, if you're arrested you at least have the presumption of innocence. You have a right against self-incrimination. That is that you can't be compelled to testify against yourself. That did not exist back in 1925. So if they wanted to talk to you, they talked to you and they could coerce you if they wanted to. And they underwent a lot of scrutiny, a lot of uh, examination, a lot of pressure and based on what was revealed during this investigative process, Dr. Sweet himself was put on trial. And uh, it was considered by many people to be the trial of the century back in 25. But uh, Dr. Sweet uh, was represented by a criminal defense attorney. His name was Clarence Darrell, who was a leading 
a uh, criminal defense attorney. I believe one of his most famous cases was the so-called Scopes Trials. Uh, the NAACP, believe it or not, was principally charged with raising money to afford the services of his legal team. And uh, believe it or not, once the trial adjourned, a jury, an all-white jury, actually acquitted Dr. Sweet of all charges against him. In the aftermath of this trial, the Michigan legislature in 1927, just two years after Dr. Sweet's exoneration, I'm pretty sure if you guys have ever looked up gun laws that are uh, on the state of Michigan's website, you'll see the Michigan Firearms Act. You'll also see that it was enacted in 1927. And in 1927, there were a ton of laws that actually went onto the books. One of those laws that went on the books was handgun registration, right? If you had a handgun, you had to get it registered. And yes, that handgun registration law is still on the books. And get this, by virtue of the law that was passed by, yes, our state legislature recently that will take effect on this uh, upcoming Valentine's Day. Remember, Valentine's Day. On Valentine's Day, we will need to also, in addition, register our long guns, our shotguns, and or our rifles. I know a big question a lot of people have been asking is, well, gee, Rick, do I have to register all of my long guns? No, no, you do not. Some people like to refer to it as a grandfather clause. I don't know. I understand what the what the reference means. I just don't understand the reference. You know, like, why did they call it that as opposed to calling it anything else? So. If you have any long guns, if you have any shotguns that you currently own, then yes, you do not need to now register them. However, after this law goes into effect, what day does this law go into effect? Valentine's, Valentine's Day, right? We'll never forget that. Valentine's Day of 2013. We will now need to... 2024. Did I say 23? Did I? I said 2013. <laughs> Please excuse me. I'm 56 years old, right? Next year, 2014, February 14th. That's if you're buying a new gun. If you're buying a brand new gun. Say, for example, if you come to this gun shop, Recoil Firearms in Taylor, Michigan, on February 14th because you want to buy your sweetheart a gun of any type, especially a long gun now, they will need to actually register that gun, right? You guys are all set up to start registering guns? Or? I haven't heard anything about it. <laughs> actually, most gun shops have... And you know, that's, a, that, that's one of the interesting things. Uh, as a matter of fact, I uh, had the audacity to call uh, a Sokol Metro Detroit police agency that I'm adequately familiar with, <coughs> Detroit, and I called their public information line because obviously I didn't have an emergency to report. And so I was talking to the officer to answer the phone. I said, so uh, when does this new long gun rifle shotgun registration law go into effect? He said, sir, you don't need to register long guns. I said, yeah, I know. I said, uh, there was a law that changed not too long ago, and from what I've been able to research and understand, on Valentine's Day, this new law will require for any new long gun that you buy, you will need to fill out paperwork and register it with the local law enforcement agency. It was like, 
no, sir, that's not true. This, this is America. And no, he started reading me the right on the Second Amendment. As being a citizen of this country, you have an absolute right to keep and bear firearms. And then at that point, you know, I wasn't in a place where I wanted to start a debate or in a place where I wanted to educate him on what was going on. It, it basically dawned on me that law enforcement agencies, I'm not going to say that they don't know. I'm quite aware that they know. <laughs> basically, a lot of them know. However, it's not at the officer level. From my media sources, and what do you mean your media sources, right? I know a few people in the media, and I was actually trying to garner some publicity for this class this weekend. And uh, they were like, gee, Rick, you know it's a great idea. He said, from you know, all the people that I've talked to in different jurisdictions, they're all aware of the fact. And between the, this trio of laws, they are literally scrambling in terms of not just understanding the law, those laws, but the administration of those laws and what type of operating process and procedures that they're going to implement to make these laws real, to actually implement them throughout their department. So they know, and a lot of people don't know. If you were to actually call Detroit Police Department and ask them, they would tell you, no, sir, uh, there's no such law in the books. It's not that there's some ill intent at play. It's just that they have not communicated that information to the people on the phone, at least on the day that I call. So be it. Yeah, basically, right now it's, it's called an RI-60. What they're going to call it now, I have no idea. I, it might be a, instead of pistol purchase permit, probably be a firearm purchase permit. And the term firearm, right? A firearm is a right pistol, rifle, and or a shotgun. So if it's your handgun, do you got to re-update them again or no? No. No, no. They already have that on record already. The only time yeah. your currently owned and possessed pistols will possibly be subject to uh, registration is if the ownership of that gun transfers. That is, if you were to sell it or, heaven forbid, you pass away and your heirs, you heirs acquire it, you know, so. And then some people have had some really interesting questions. They're like, well, gee, Rick, uh, how would someone know in the government if, say, someone in a, 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 a right, you know the question, right? They acquired a gun after the date and then say that they bought it, you know, six months ago. They're not going to know. I don't know. Weren't they trying to put in there where you had to take a gun if you sell a rifle or whatever and you had to go to a gun shop and have them do the sailing and stuff, the sales for you? Did that ever get put into that? Uh, I didn't see that in the statute. Private sale. Private You'll get a firearm purchase from. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing: you could do that way ahead of time and say, yeah, "Well, that was done years ago." I did that. I sold. Look, 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 look! I'm not, I'm not floating any ideas on any circumventions that. I saw it two years ago. That some people are entertaining. I mean, it is what it is. Did you say something? Is it 10 days? Okay. Like it used to be years ago with the handgun, same thing. You used to go to the police department. Yeah, they used to be 10 days. I believe they're going to, they're going to 30 days now, so. February 14th. Valentine's Day. <laughs> Valentine's Day. to be clear, any currently owned long gun does not have to be registered as long as you're the owner and you bought it. Is that true? Correct. New. That is New is when you're going to have to do it. What, he's talking about a gun that you currently own. Right. Yeah. You're buying something brand new. Say, for example, you know what? We should do a, like a buying, 
buy a firearm day right here at Recoil Firearm. No, no, we're going to buy one on Valentine's Day. <laughs> uh, buy two. Why buy two? Tell you what. Let's take a... Uh, Let's make it a uh, 10 minute break. I need to make a quick pit stop and uh, we'll get picked up.